This Clay Jug by Kabir. Inside this clay jug there are canyons and pine mountains and the maker of canyons and pine mountains. All seven oceans are inside and hundreds of millions of stars. The acid that tests gold is here and the one who judges jewels. And the music that comes from the strings that no one touches and the source of all water. If you want the truth, I will tell you the truth. Friend, listen. The God whom I love is inside. Thanks, Eric. Kabir was a 15th century Indian mystic poet, um, grew up in the space between Islam and Hinduism um, and is revered as, a, as an influential poet across uh, many mystical traditions around the world. So we go from a, a poem written nearly 600 years ago um, to a poem written just a few weeks ago. This poem is by Ross Gay. Ross Gay um, is 40 years old. Um, he is a professor of creative writing at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and his poems, he is most famous for his poems um, that have to do with gardening. He's an avid gardener. And this poem, uh, which touches on current events, is entitled, A Small Needful Fact. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. And a final poem of the morning um, that Eric will read to us. Uh, it's written by Marge Piercy. Um, I wouldn't call Marge Piercy the Poet Laureate of Unitarian Universalism, but uh, she's on that kind of lower pantheon of favorite UU poets. There's many of her poems in the back of our hymnal. Um, Marge Piercy, she's alive. She's 80 years old and lives in Wellfleet, Massachusetts, um, and is a famous feminist poet as well as a famous social activist. And Eric will read her poem, The Low Road. The Low Road by Marge Piercy. What can they do to you, whatever they want? They can set you up, bust you. They can break your fingers, burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take away your children, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't stop them doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight you can refuse. You can take whatever revenge you can, but they roll right over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing fire can break a cordon. Termites can bring down a mansion. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope. Three people are a delegation, a cell, a wedge. With four, you can play games and start a collective. With six, you can rent a whole house, have pie for dinner with no seconds, and make your own music. Thirteen makes a circle, a hundred fill a hall, a thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter. 10,000, community and your own papers. 100,000, a network of communities. A million, our own world. It goes one at a time. 
It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they say no. It starts when you say we and know, what you, uh, know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. What a, a treat it is to have Dorothy and Glenn playing cello and piano for us this morning. Give them, give them an applause for their wonderful music. So I want to go, go meta here a little bit and, and tell you kind of what, how, this, how this sermon came into being. There's this, there's this old saying among ministers, um, which goes like this, uh, any minister who doesn't spend at least a little time browsing the want ads in the weeks following Easter hasn't properly done his or her job. <laughs> it was the great uh, poet T.S. Eliot, um, by the way, was raised as a Unitarian, uh, but then, then left Unitarianism for Anglicanism. Uh, it was T.S. Eliot who wrote, April is the cruelest month. And, um, and ministers tend to agree with this. So here we are. It's early May. It's graduation day for UNC. If you're in college, university, the school year is over. If you're in high school or elementary school or elementary school. The school year is winding down. The church year is winding down. Next week, the coming of age youth will be celebrating the end of their program um, with uh, holding, doing the worship service for us. The week after that, we'll be returning to one service for Memorial Day weekend. There's a budget town hall coming up, then an annual meeting, and there's volunteers to thank and awards to give out. We're in the final stretches. Ministries and committees are diligently writing their reports for the annual report and assessing how they did this year. I've sent in my registration for General Assembly in June, and I'm making some vacation plans for July. And in my early years in ministry, I would, when it came time to write out the service titles for the May newsletter, I would hit a sermon writing block around this time of the year. April is the cruelest month. I'd find myself stumbling towards the finish line. And those of you whose lives move on an academic calendar, whether your work is that way or your education is that way or your children's calendar is that way, you understand what I'm saying, right? So I came up with an idea one year when the inspiration just wasn't coming. I would declare a Sunday, Poetry Sunday, and throw together a bunch of poems that had been on my mind, poems that were rolling around in my mind, maybe an old favorite or a shiny new poem that had recently taken my breath away. And then I'd let those poems do the heavy lifting with their beauty and their truth. And my sermon would simply be some assorted reflections on, on why those poems were speaking to my life now and what they all had to do with each other. Poetry is a spiritual practice for me. I almost always have a book of poetry that I'm working my way through, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. And I have other poems, other poems that I'm reading over and over again, that I'm actually attempting to memorize. Um, and I, I do that. Not, not the whole poems, but just a couple lines or a couplet or a stanza that I can recall at any time when I pass through a portion of life that that poem speaks to. Laurel Hallman and Harry Schofield, um, two great UU ministers, talk about these heart poems, these, quote, words and phrases and even whole narrative stories that point beyond themselves into the depth of human experience, a poetic truth that nourishes the heart, opens the mind, and communicates to the depths. Laurel Hallman was once given an hour to, to advise UU ministers on how to do ministry better, and she actually said, read and memorize more poetry, was her, was her response, an interesting response. And I thought maybe if I nourish the heart with a little poetry, this weary time of the year, that slog to the end, will be a little bit more bearable for me, and for you, the listener, a little more enjoyable. So I had five poems that came to me, 
The Door by Jane Hirschfield, The Lanyard by Billy Collins for Mother's Day, This Clay Jug by the Indian mystic poet Kabir, Ross Gay's contemporary poem about Eric Garner, the black man choked to death last summer by New York police officers on the streets of New York City, and Marge Piercy's revolutionary poem, The Low Road. In all five poems, some more so, some less so, but really in all five, I think there is a common thread, a common thread of small, ordinary, commonplace things containing seeds of great meaning. Billy Collins is ricocheting around the room when he happens to stumble across the dictionary lying open to the L section. He sees the word lanyard and is transported back to summer camp to weaving a plastic lanyard for his mother. And this small memory, this small, insignificant, useless object, I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them, becomes a container for this larger relationship, he with his mother and with life. And you have to wonder if one odd little random word in the dictionary means so much, then how full, how full must this entire world be with significance and story? Jane Hirschfield's challenging poem, The Door, works in much the same way, I think. Her poem is about the tiny, minuscule spaces between things, the moments between the contractions of the two-beating heart, the moment before the wood owl repeats its call, the rest note unwritten, hinged between worlds that precedes change and allows it. And her poem suggests that these spaces are worth noticing, that they have an importance to them. Her poems are difficult and challenging. They make you work. And because she's drawing from Eastern thought and philosophy, there is an implicit challenge to Western materialism, to the idea that things are the only things and that more and bigger is better. Paradoxically, she points out how it is that the rest note gives us music. Kabir presents a mystic vision of all creation in his poem, This Clay Jug. And it's a a poem, perhaps, also about the smallness of our world. This clay jug, it contains pine mountains and canyons and the makers of canyons and pine mountains and hundreds of millions of stars. And as I read this short poem, I'm reminded of lessons from modern science, from physics and chemistry, those lessons that tell us inconceivably how most of matter is actually empty space and that the elements that make up a clay jug are not very different than the elements that make up our bodies. The religious way of saying this is to say, out of dust we were born, into dust we shall return. Or in this clay jug, there are canyons and pine mountains. And he sees a clay jug, a simple empty vessel as containing worlds, containing multitudes, as Whitman would put it. And then it comes to mind Ross Gay's devastating poem entitled A Small and Needful Fact. And in this poem, we move from childhood art projects and pottery and empty spaces to a poem about human life and implicitly about the contemporary struggle with systemic racism and the criminal justice system and poverty and police brutality and civil rights. Ross Gay's poem is a mere 87 words. It takes about 40 seconds to read out loud. And it's actually even shorter if you realize that the bulk of the poem consists of a string of qualifying words, perhaps most likely in all likelihood. And those qualifying words actually point to something profound and sad, that we as the reader and Ross Gay as the poet, that we actually don't know very much about Eric Garner, We know how he died, but all else in his biography is largely mystery to us. And so in one respect, the title of Roske's poem, A Small Needful Fact, refers to one single biographical fact about Eric Garner, that he worked for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department. 
one small needful fact about a life we tragically don't know much about, don't understand far from my own experience at least. It is these small things, these small facts that are easily dismissed, but when we add them, more and more to them, layer upon layer, we flesh out human life and human dignity. Or is the small needful fact that plants turn carbon dioxide into oxygen, create air for us to breathe, is the world, is the world constituted out of small and necessary facts? And so we conclude with Marge Piercy's poem, The Low Road, in which she sketches out a mathematics of power, resistance, social change, and transformation. Alone, they roll right over you, but in twos and threes, fours and sixes, 13, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 1 million, 10 million, power grows and change happens. But at the end, she returns to the small and needful fact, which is that it goes one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say, we, and know who you mean. And each day, you mean one more. And each day, you mean one more. Much of our world is categorized in a hierarchy in which there are big, important things and small, unimportant things. Some things are of great significance and others are not. Some people are more important and others are not. VIPs and rankings and honors. Don't sweat the small stuff. Put first things first. The wisdom in all five poems, each in its own way, each in its own different way, challenges modes of thinking that create those hierarchies. It insists that change happens one-to-one, person-to-person. It asserts the fact that each of us is small in our own way, but that together we are powerful. Just as the memory of a small plastic lanyard can bring back memories, powerful memories. Just as the rest note helps to create the music just as the clay jug contains the elements of the universe, just as the plants that we put in the ground help us to breathe, just as it starts when you say we and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. Thank you for sharing these poems with me this morning. Thank you.